Hey, this is Jeff Fortson of Auto Trends with JeffCars.com. Today we have with us Kevin Tynan. He's joined us for the first time this year to actually help us analyze what's been going on for the first quarter of this year. And he's also going to project what he's expecting for the second quarter or for the next half of the year. He's a Bloomberg. Uh, he's a senior analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence. Hey, Kevin, welcome. Hey, buddy. How you doing? Hey, doing great. It's great to actually see you. This is yeah. our first time actually being able to not only hear you, but also see you live. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, good. I think I don't probably better on radio. I dress for radio. That's for sure. <laughs> I dressed up for you, man. I put on a, <laughs> I put on a nice shirt for you this morning. So, all right, let's uh, shift gears. Let's do a recap on as far as where we ended up for the first quarter. And obviously, we're talking to everyday consumers. You're yeah. used to talking to folks in the industry who are industry insiders. So we're going to give them some insight as far as where we wrapped up with the quarter. We know that currently around one out of six consumers are paying over $1,000 a month for a monthly car payment, which is unheard of. We're going to talk about some leasing numbers. We're going to talk about some highs and lows. And also, uh, just as of recently, we're going to talk about this EPA announcement by, by the Biden administration, which is going to push more of us into electric vehicles. All right, Kevin, give us, uh, give us, give us the highs and lows from the quarter. Yeah, so the first quarter was um, about a 15.1 million unit run rate. And just to put that in context, in the best of times, volume wise, we'd be about a 17 million. So the industry as a whole is down when you think about just the unit sales that are going from, you know, the manufacturers through the dealers to the consumer. Uh, the difference, though, now is that we're talking about record high transaction prices. So from a consumer's perspective, ideally, you have less choice, there's less inventory on the ground, um, and you're paying more for higher contented vehicles. So when the consumer looks at it, it's it's less choice and higher prices. When the mm -hmm. manufacturers look at it, it's you know less cost in producing things. It's less inventory uh, generating expenses, uh, and it's simpler for them. Fewer units, higher transaction prices is actually a better scenario for the manufacturers. And I think it's the kind of thing they're going to stick to. We're in a little bit of a transition, right? This was really bad from a consumer's perspective during 2022, where the industry averaged over sticker price. The consumer was paying as much as $1,000 over sticker. Um, that has come down. Now, 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 let me, let me, let me, let me interrupt for a second, Kevin. Yeah. Notice that Kevin said the average. We know of consumers who are paying three thousand, ten thousand. I know of a Mercedes Benz dealer that was asking for twenty thousand dollars over yeah. one of their vehicles. And the thing was, it was every brand, it was every manufacturer. So it wasn't just an average of a thousand. That it was the luxury manufacturers that were getting way over sticker and everybody else was, you know, still under, it wasn't, everybody was over sticker. Now the downside to that is obviously the consumer's paying more. Uh, but the other thing is we we've kind of come off that, right? We're back below sticker price. The problem is that has happened because the manufacturer has raised MSRP, not so much because transaction prices have come down. So off of MSRP, the industry is averaging, I don't know, $300 below. Back mm -hmm. in the day, you know, peak volume of 2016, it, we would be $2,300, $2,400 below MSRP. Now we're about $300. All right. So let's, let's since we're talking about inventory, our... Let's talk about, are we seeing more incentives come available now? I was having a conversation with a dealer uh, just yesterday, and they mentioned that some of the incentives that's available now are better than they were a month or two months or a quarter ago. Sure. Yeah, well, you, you know, and there's a lot of that kind of dynamic going on in the industry with all kinds of metrics, right? Inventory is one of them. 
and incentives are another, right? So they're better than they were, but they're nowhere near what they were prior to the pandemic, right? Um, inventory levels, to give you an example, we're still below about 2 million units on the ground. Prior to the pandemic, there would be 4 million units. So it's the same thing with incentives. Now we may be where it was below 2% in incentives on average for the industry. We may be a little bit above 2%, but back in the day, it was 10%. So the, you know, the industry is really at a place from the consumer and the manufacturer's perspective where the pendulum swung really far to favor pricing on low inventory. Uh, but but the, what you give up as a manufacturer in that situation is you don't sell as much stuff, right? You sell it for a higher price, but your volume isn't what it used to be. And I think we're in this window right now where we're coming back a little bit like, hey, we're leaving sales on the table by not having enough inventory. So let's build a little bit more, but it's certainly not anywhere near. And I don't think there's any intention to go back to those 4 million units of inventory on the ground days at 10% incentive and 2300 off sticker. I think this is a very comfortable place for the automakers to be, and it's going to squeeze the consumer a little bit. All right. So let's talk about average transaction prices too, because we need to drive this home. So Kevin, I'm looking at average transaction prices and Toyota made an announcement, uh, uh, about a month or so ago was that they're expecting the prices to push uh transaction price to push over 50,000. We're sitting at, I think around $49,000 right now. And that's combined in cars, trucks, uh, electric vehicles, diesels, all that thrown into the crossovers, SUVs, all thrown into the mix. And then we look at electric vehicle pricing right now is somewhere between 66 to $67,000. What needs to be done or what's occurring right now within the automotive industry to make vehicles more affordable? What's going on from a lease standpoint? Because at one point, wasn't leasing one out of every three vehicles we were leasing? So where are we now with leasing? So March was about 19 and a half percent. So, yeah, we would be 30, 33, 35 uh, percent at the peak of leasing. Now, for the full year of 2022, it was like 18 and a half. Um, and now we just peaked a little bit higher in March at 19 and a half. But, you know, that's going to be an issue in terms of affordability for the consumer because, you know, it's not all of the used market is the off lease vehicles, but it's probably the best, right? It's three year old mm -hmm. vehicles, 30,000 miles or so, late model uh you know high content you know the latest technology in those vehicles and when you think about it jeff you know in the days hey, Kevin, let me let me interrupt for a second so we're making sure that the our listeners and the folks who are watching this understands is that the because what kevin is actually actually going through for you right now is all the advantages of leasing is that leasing helps to return vehicles back to the market within a two-year or three-year period, which makes it affordable, good late model vehicles that uh, are end up on the used car market. Well, what, what are some other things, Kevin? From right. So, standpoint? so looking at you know the days where we would sell 17 million units in this country at 30 percent lease penetration. You're talking about a rolling every three years because the average lease term is about 36 months. So every three years, there would be 5 million off lease vehicles coming into that pre-owned market, right? Certified pre-owned or just regular pre-owned vehicles. And it gave the consumer some choice in terms of affordability. The problem in the last couple of years, especially since the pandemic, is not only has the volume of vehicles gone down to 14 to 15 million units, um, lease penetration, like I said, went below 20%. Mm -hmm. So if you just do the simple math, 17 million units at 30% lease penetration is 5 million off lease. In 2022, which would be vehicles coming back used in 2025, we had 14 million units at 18% lease penetration. So you're talking about 2.4 million coming back off lease. So from 2022, to 2025, the off-lease market goes from 5 million to two and a half, gets cut in half mm -hmm. within three years. And that's going to be a problem, right? Because as you know, the less supply and if there's demand, the higher the price. 
So the idea that the consumer can sit back and wait for lower prices on new or used vehicles, the, the, the economics of supply and demand do not support that argument. And I'm saying consumers are going to have a problem finding affordable used cars in the next three years as well. So what, what about used car prices right now? Are What's the latest stats that you have right now? Average price or, or average price of vehicles that's on the lot right now? Right. So it's in the $30,000 range, right? And Or, you know, thereabout. And so when, when, what, when at one point we were, excuse me, we were used to used yeah. vehicles being at $20,000. So yeah. we're looking at $30,000 right now. Right. And now, and, and what's happening is, because I, what I like to look at is the gap in the price between new and used. Okay. And the, and the thinking there is that if new car prices get too high and used prices stay low, you get what I call an affordability gap. So you're going to have people say, well, why would I buy the new one when I could buy the used one for a lot less? They've both gone up. So that gap has gotten wider and it hasn't mattered because you're talking about $33,000 used vehicles, which used to be the price of a new vehicle, you know, six, seven years ago. So there hasn't, there's not, you're not getting much choice to buy new or used because everything's expensive and it's okay. going to stay that way. Like I said, probably at least through 2025. All right, Kevin, let me uh, wind down this segment here and we'll have our listeners to uh, stay with us and we'll resume this conversation during the second half of our program. Also, we're going to talk about TikTok a little bit also coming into vehicles or possibly coming into vehicles and see what your thoughts are. So sit tight. We'll be back after the break. Hey, this is Jeff Fortson of AutoTrends with JeffCars.com. We're resuming our conversation with Kevin Tynan. He's a senior analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence. Hey, Kevin, how are you doing? Hey, bud. Doing great. Hey, man, it's great to actually see you live. Actually, Kevin, that's not your real title. I met you back in November for the first time. We've been doing this show for several years, and here I am in the audience, and you're on stage, and I see something global <laughs> come across the uh, uh, scrolling across the what's it, the icon, or whatever they call. It. Yeah. I can't remember what they call it. And is that called the icon? What is that called when we see your title scroll across? Well, uh, in the news business, I, from what I understand, they call it the crawl. That's yeah, it. The crawl. Means, that's it. That's it. Yeah. As if, as if I'm not in the news business, I, <laughs> I just pretend to be. So. Kevin, what's your actual title itself? So I'm the global director of automotive research for Bloomberg Intelligence, but it, I couldn't fit all that in the in the in the banner. Show, so show, I uh, show, so I show off, it. show off. I'm I'm happy to have him. So it's great to actually see you, and it was actually great to see you a few months oh, ago for the first here. time in person. All right, let's continue our conversation. Uh, uh, letting consumers know what's going on in the used car market and pricing and affordability. So I'm hearing from some dealers, from some automakers, is that they're pushing leasing again uh, post-COVID at this point. And let's also talk about electric vehicles. So there was the Inflation Reduction Act that was introduced back in October of last year. Sorry, August of last year. And a lot of cars no longer qualified for it based upon the income stipulations that were put into place, based upon stipulations of where the vehicle need to be manufactured, where the batteries need to be sourced from, things of that sort. And so a number of vehicles just literally fell off the list and aren't currently qualifying for it. However, as of January of this year, uh, because of of something that was included within the Inflation Reduction Act is that every electric vehicle that's available here in the States is now eligible for a $7,500 um, lease credit that you could utilize as long as the leasing company in which you're purchasing a new car from pass along that $7,500 to you. And of course they will to the consumer is that you can get $7,500 off the price, which again, lowers the sticker price of the vehicle, making the vehicle more affordable. What are some other things that are, what are you seeing right now with incentives right now? Uh, as far as are more incentives are coming available? What's the average interest rate right now? And we forgot also to talk about Kevin. I know I'm throwing a lot at you right now because you're super smart. What's what's we're hearing like the the big R word recession. General Motors 
just did uh, asked a lot of individuals if they were willing to retire. 5,000 white collar professionals accepted that. Uh, we see in the tech industry uh, where there are a number of folks who've been let go over the past few weeks, over the past few months. Is there a recession looming? What are you hearing? What are you seeing in your research? What's the word on the street? Yeah, you know, uh, it would seem that way, right? We went through such a period of expansion um, and and easy money, if you will, low interest rates, you know, really to drive growth. And that's, you know, the, the macroeconomic, it, it's cyclical, right? So at some point, you got to pause, you got to pay the piper, right, for that easy money. And I think that's right where we are. Now, the unfortunate thing, Jeff, is that, you know, there's a lot of automakers, or especially the pure play EV automakers, that are just trying to build scale at this point. Okay, and give us give us an example for our, so Rivian, our Lucid um, are two of the the obvious examples that are trying to break into the EV space, building vehicles. And they're you know Lucid for example built seven thousand units total um, last year in a year seven thousand. They only delivered a little bit more than four thousand of those. It's very expensive, right? So you're building things that you're not collecting money for. So their gross profit was actually negative per vehicle by a lot, uh, by scary numbers in the financial world. So very inopportune time to be going through a recession if you're trying to build scale. Now, if using Tesla as a comparison, Tesla started selling Model S in the United States in 2013, coming out of you know, the global financial crisis of 2008, 2009. So they really went unimpeded, at least macroeconomically from 2013 to 2023 without that kind of recession uh, or significant macroeconomic pullback. And it got them to scale and to profitability. Um, and now you have Rivian and Lucid who are just starting to try and ramp production and you're getting inflation costs in terms of materials and labor. And so it's actually costing those two companies more to build a vehicle than they can sell them for. So it's not that they're unprofitable at the operating line, which is, you know, all your other expenses or your net line where taxes and we're talking about at the gross profit line. So simply what it costs you to build something you can't sell it for that, which is a very scary place to be. It's not, you know, it's not unreasonable for a, you know, a new entrant in the space to be unprofitable, but it's a very, very bad time with a recession coming, assuming that the consumer isn't going to be, or is going to be a lot more tentative with their money uh, to get you to scale or to get you to gross profit in this environment is going to be very, very difficult. So, Kevin, so you do foresee a recession's coming? That's the word on the street, yes or no? Uh, yes, that's the word on the street. I I know cars. I'm not an ec uh, economist. I know, I know, I know. Okay, so. Oh, yeah, right, so I think second half of the year is the is the general consensus that um, we're in recession by the end of the year. How How deep and the duration of that, you know, I don't know, but the feeling is that it would be reasonably unavoidable by the second half of this year. All right. So as we're talking about Tesla, so you mentioned um, uh, you were talking about a few of the new startups and them being unprofitable. Is Tesla making money right now? And the reason I ask that, because they also they, they've been cutting their prices uh, to meet Inflation Reduction Act. It's been driving up volume, uh, obviously. And then also we looked at Ford made an announcement recently because they've separated their they've separated uh, their their business units where they have the electric vehicles that they put in one category ICE which are the internal uh, uh which are the gasoline units so to speak gasoline diesel units uh all in one talk to us uh about Ford losing a few billion dollars on their EVs and expect to make some money off of it and then it's Tesla making money off EVs yeah Tesla's making money now um you know, there's a lot of things in the Tesla accounting that go into it, right? They, two, two things that really jump out. One is regulatory credit sales, right? So there's emission reduction goals that automakers have to hit. 
building EVs, Tesla gets a lot of these credits. Automakers can buy credits from uh, other automakers. And the place to go is obviously Tesla because they have plenty of them. So those regulatory credit sales count as revenue, but ultimately, which is by revenue, it may be, I wouldn't call it a drop in the bucket, but it's less significant. But the thing is, there's really no cost, direct cost associated with those credit sales. So they essentially, what you book as revenue, you can push right down to the profit line because there's no materials or labor or any kind of expense associated with them. So their regulatory sales basically turn into profit. Now, the other thing that they do is they collect money and it's deferred revenue, meaning they collect it, but they don't necessarily book it right away for that full self-driving technology, which is someday you will be able to go to sleep while your car, or you could be asleep and your car- Are some folks them. doing it right now? Right, yeah. So, <laughs> so anyway, so so that, that, that's a $15,000 package that they will collect the revenue for, put it in deferred revenue, but they'll release that revenue as they say there's been advances in the technology, right? Because they're collecting money on something that technically doesn't exist, but every quarter they'll say, oh, let's release some of that deferred revenue for full self-driving because we've advanced the technology. So Tesla's margins are really hard. They are profitable. They're, they're really okay. hard to get a gauge compared to other automakers. Okay, so Kevin, I want to cover a few more topics with you on it. So let's talk about Ford and them losing the three billion dollars on their EVs. When do we? When do you foresee them turning a profit? So here's the thing, right? So all automakers are going EV. I believe that this is the next growth opportunity. I, you know, and we've talked about this a million times, Jeff. Right? That. The technology is not profitable yet. It's the right strategy. I just think the timing is wrong. Why it has to work and why it will work is because automakers need that next jump in revenue per unit, the next drive of prices higher. And why I say that is because we in the, in the US, we got stuck at 17 million units a couple of times. And like I said earlier, I think we're a 14, 15 million unit market. So automakers can't grow by a growing market and getting more market share in a growing market. So what has happened since 2013 is that that growth opportunity has come from shifting to truck from car, right? Trucks more expensive, better profit margins. So easily we just build more of those, fewer of these. And in a stagnant volume market, our mix is better. We're more profitable. And that's been the scene for 10 years. Problem is, Companies like Ford are already 99% truck. There's nowhere Kevin, to go. Kevin, hold on for a second. We're going to have to wind down this conversation. I knew we couldn't get through one show together. Uh, for radio purposes, we're going to have to wind down this conversation. And we're going to see if we can actually carry over for a second show. So we've got a lot more to cover, uh, especially this is our first time actually connected for the year. So uh, you and I can just talk forever. So let's wind down this conversation. And... Uh, We'll have uh, our listeners to tune back in with us next week uh, for uh, more of this conversation. We'll let you know if you need to go to YouTube to catch uh, the additional conversation in case we don't carry this over for a second airplay for radio. So sit tight with us and uh, we'll be back with you next week and we'll let you know via what channel. Check in with us at Twitter uh, at Jeff Cars. Again, Twitter at Jeff Cars. Hey, Kevin, thank you. You got it, buddy.